Christian Leaders of the 18th Century by J. C. Ryle Our second study in this series of short biographies is of the famous Methodist preacher and evangelist John Wesley. Chapter 1, Part 1 of John Wesley and His Ministry The second in the list of English reformers of the last century whose history I propose to consider, is a man of worldwide reputation, the famous John Wesley. The name of this great evangelist is perhaps better known than that of any of his fellow labourers a hundred years ago. This, however, is easily accounted for. He lived to the ripe old age of 88. For 65 years he was continually before the eyes of the public and doing his master's work in every part of England. He founded a new religious denomination, remarkable to this very day for its numbers, laboriousness and success, and justly proud of its great founder. His life has been repeatedly written by his friends and followers, his works constantly reprinted, his precepts and maxims reverentially treasured up and embalmed, like Joseph's bones. In fact, If ever a good Protestant has been practically canonised, it has been John Wesley. It would be strange indeed if his name was not well known. Of such a man as this I cannot pretend to give more than a brief account in the short space of a few pages. The leading facts of his long and well-spent life and the leading features of his peculiar character are all that I can possibly compress into the limits of this memoir. Those who want more must look elsewhere. And here Ryle appends a brief note to say, The principal lives of Wesley by Methodist hands are those of Whitehead, Moore and Watson. So this well-known life of Wesley is not a fair book, and the unfavourable animus of the writer throughout is painfully manifest. The best, most impartial and most complete account of Wesley is one published by Seeley, in 1856, by an anonymous writer. Then Ryle resumes. John Wesley was born on the 17th of June, 1703, at Epworth, in North Lincolnshire, of which parish his father was rector. He was the ninth of a family of at least 13 children, comprising three sons and ten daughters. Of the daughters, those who grew up made singularly foolish and unhappy marriages. Of the sons, the eldest, Samuel, was for some years usher of Westminster School and an intimate friend of the famous Bishop Atterbury, and finally died headmaster of Tiverton School. The second, John, was founder of the Methodist Communion, and the third, Charles, was almost throughout life John's companion and fellow labourer. John Wesley's father was a man of considerable learning and great activity of mind. As a writer, he was always bringing out something, either in prose or in verse, but nothing, unhappily for his pocket, which was ever acceptable to the reading public, or is much cared for in the present day. As a politician, he was a zealous supporter of the Revolution, which brought into England the House of Orange, and it was on this account that Queen Mary presented him to the crown living of Epworth. As a clergyman he seems to have been a diligent pastor and preacher of the theological school of Archbishop Tillotson. As a manager of his worldly affairs he appears to have been most unsuccessful. Though rector of a living now valued at £1,000 a year, he was always in pecuniary difficulties, was once in prison for debt and finally left his widow and children almost destitute. When I add to this that he was not on good terms with his parishioners and, poor as he was, insisted on going up to London every year to attend the very unprofitable meetings of convocation for months at a time, the reader will probably agree with me that, like too many, he was a man of more book learning and cleverness than good sense. The mother of John Wesley was evidently a woman of extraordinary power of mind. She was the daughter of Dr. Annesley, a man well known to readers of Puritan theology, 
as one of the chief promoters of the morning exercises, and ejected from St Giles, Cripplegate, in 1662. From him she seems to have inherited the masculine sense and strong decided judgment which distinguished her character. To the influence of his mother's early training and example, John Wesley, doubtless, was indebted for many of his peculiar habits of mind and qualifications. Her own account of the way in which she educated all her children, in one of her letters to her son John, is enough to show that she was no common woman, and that her sons were not likely to turn out common men. She says, None of them was taught to read till five years old, except Kezia, in whose case I was overruled, and she was more years in learning than any of the rest had been months. The way of teaching was this. The day before a child began to learn, the house was set in order. Everyone's work appointed them, and a charge given that none should come into the room from nine to twelve, or from two to five, which were our school hours. One day was allowed the child wherein to learn its letters, and each of them did in that time know all its letters, great and small, except Molly and Nancy who were a day and a half before they knew them perfectly, for which I then thought them very dull. But the reason why I thought them so was because the rest learned so readily, and your brother Samuel, who was the first child I ever taught, learnt the alphabet in a few hours. He was five years old on the 10th of February. The next day he began to learn, and as soon as he knew the letters began at the first chapter of Genesis. He was taught to spell the first verse, then to read it over and over, till he could read it off-hand without any hesitation, so on to the second, etc., till he took ten verses for a lesson, which he quickly did. Easter fell low that year, and by Whitsuntide he could read a chapter very well, for he read continually, and had such a prodigious memory that I cannot remember ever to have told him the same word twice. What was stranger, any word he had learnt in his lesson, he knew wherever he saw it, either in his Bible or any other book, by which means he learned very soon to read an English author well. Her energetic and decided conduct as a wife of a parish clergyman is strikingly illustrated by a correspondence still extant between herself and her husband on a curious occasion. It appears that during Mr. Wesley's long protracted absences from home in attending convocation, Mrs. Wesley, dissatisfied with the state of things at Epworth, began the habit of gathering a few parishioners at the rectory on Sunday evenings and reading to them. As might naturally have been expected, the attendance soon became so large that her husband took alarm at the report he heard and made some objections to the practice. The letters of Mrs. Wesley on this occasion are a model of strong, hard-headed Christian good sense, and deserve the perusal of many timid believers in the present day. After defending what she had done by many wise and unanswerable arguments, and beseeching her husband to consider seriously the bad consequences of stopping the meeting, she winds up all with the following remarkable paragraph. If you do, after all, think fit to dissolve this assembly, Do not tell me that you desire me to do it, for that will not satisfy my conscience. But send me your positive command in such full and express terms as may absolve me from all guilt and punishment for neglecting the opportunity of doing good, when you and I shall appear before the great and awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. A mother of this stamp was just the person to leave deep marks and impressions on the minds of her children. Of the old rector of Epworth we can trace little in his son John and Charles, except perhaps their poetical genius. But there is much in John's career and character throughout life which shows the hand of his mother. The early years of John Wesley's life appear to have passed quietly away in his Lincolnshire home. The only remarkable event recorded by his biographers is his marvellous escape from being burnt alive, when Epworth Rectory was burned down. This happened in 1709, 
when he was six years old, and seems to have been vividly impressed on his mind. He was pulled through the bedroom window, at the last moment, by a man who, for want of a ladder, stood on another man's shoulders. Just at that moment the roof of the house fell in, but happily fell inward, and the boy and his deliverer escaped unhurt. He says himself, in his description of the event, When they brought me to the house where my father was, he cried out, Come, neighbours, let us kneel down, let us give thanks to God. He has given me all my eight children. Let the house go, I am rich enough.' 